And the same week that we were aggressively trying to get to the first close was the week that the world realized that this COVID, COVID thing was going to be a real problem. So our investors were coming back to us and saying, we want to support you. We want to be part of the fund, but you know, are you watching the news? Um, and the markets were like whipsawing up and down 3%. Over the past few years, we've seen an interesting rise by family offices. The family office was initially created to look after the wealth of ultra high net worth families, but today the modern day family office does far more than that. And in fact, is acting a whole lot more like a venture investor. Not only are many increasing their allocations to venture capital as a way to capture the potential upside of deals, they're also building out their in-house capabilities to directly and successfully invest in startups. In comes my next guest, Phil Pickering, COO, General Counsel, and Head of Venture Investing at Volpes, a family office built off the wealth of Stephen Diggle, who founded Atradis Fund Management. Atratus was an Asian long volatility by its multi-strategy alternative asset manager and at its helm grew assets under management from $4 million to $4.7 billion at its peak in 2008. Volpes today is actively investing early stage capital across Southeast Asia and manages the only dedicated venture fund for the country of Myanmar. Volpes is also the fund management partner for Padarma, the largest impact investor in Southeast Asia. Today, we unpack Phil's strategies for growth and his view on what next. You don't want to miss it. Welcome to Villain Dollar Moves, the show for the top US and Asia founders, funders, and execs. From the growing pains of a unicorn journey to IPO, scaling a venture capital firm, and the shift of wealth, we cover it all. started here, Phil, you know, I, I mentioned this a little bit in the prelude that, you know, billion dollar moves is uh, the rule is no corporate BS here. Really want to know the story behind the person that's holding the title, writing the checks, so and so forth. And today really want to start with your career path. Uh, I know you started in law and decided that uh, that was not really for you, although you do um, play certain legal roles right now in the fund management business and all that. So Tell us a little bit about you, your career path, uh, the big why, and some of the risks that you took. So I went to law school. I was a lawyer for a couple of years in an international law firm in the M&A group. Wanted to get out as soon as I started. And after two years, I did get out. I joined an Australian company putting together carbon offset projects, which was really interesting. And we were putting together energy efficiency projects and selling those energy savings into markets where we could. And I thought it would be a place where I'd spend my entire career. And then around 2007, 2008, the U.S. didn't sign on to a global framework. So the carbon market, the carbon pricing sort of dropped um, and never recovered. And so it was clear I needed to do something else. And around that time, I was flying back to San Francisco where we were living. And a big read in the Financial Times that day I had an article and it said in 1809, you needed to live in London. That was the capital of the world, financial capital of the world. In 1909, you needed to live in New York. And in 2009, the, the financial capital of the world is Asia, and they, they used Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Singapore um, as an example. And I read that at a time when I needed to do something else because it was clear I didn't have a future in the carbon markets. Uh, and that started the process of me thinking about making a move to Asia. And how did that go? I mean, I, I understand that you had to um, also get your wife on board, right? <laughs> yeah, when I proposed that we move to, that we pick up and move to Asia without jobs, uh, she told me to go to my room and, um, and sleep it off. But uh, we came up with a plan and ultimately, uh, ultimately it worked. She was working for a U.S. bank at the time, was able to transfer with the U.S. bank. Mm -hmm. and, but one of the things that immediately struck me about Hong Kong and Singapore um, was I went over there and started talking to people and everybody was accessible. Like you couldn't get those meetings in, in the U.S. You know, senior mm -hmm. people wouldn't have time to, to sit with some guy who's kind of looking for his, uh, his career path. And everybody in Singapore and Hong Kong, very senior people were willing to, to have a cup of coffee, have a beer with me. And it really struck me that it was different. Uh, and that was really mm -hmm. appealing to me. And ultimately we found a way to 
find employment and move to Singapore. And we've been there for about 11 years now. The landscape has changed significantly in, in the last 10 years. And you found yourself, of course, in, in Volpes. Uh, t- tell us a little bit about how, how you got yourself involved there. So I worked for two other investment groups first in Singapore. And when you have a law degree, people always want want to assume that you're a lawyer. It's like you're branded for life. So I worked for two investment groups and got put into portfolio companies to help them mm. during certain transactions. And I was put into a company, a portfolio company in the U.S. from the Singapore investment group. We made an investment in 2014. I was going back and forth between the U.S. and Singapore. And in the year that I did that, the investment group in Singapore changed. And so there wasn't a place for me to go back to. Um, and Volpez had an opening or had a need for a new COO and general counsel. And when I spoke to the CEO at, at Volpez, I, I said, I don't really want to, I don't want my future to be as a lawyer. Uh, and he yeah. was very kind and said, look, the, the need we have now is t- for someone to be the CEO and general counsel. But if you want to pursue other areas of investment for the group, you know, by all means, you can do that. You know, you, you'll have a, a platform with Volpez and you'll have some freedom to, to go and do that. And I really pushed us into, into venture investing first, investing into funds, and then uh, now managing our own third party capital in the venture space. I really love that. I mean, you know, really carving your niche for yourself and I think really asking for it. Not many people in their careers um, do that, right? And and then they end up in places where, oh, that was the natural trajectory, but it's not really what I want to do. So I, I'm glad you were able to find that sort of sweet spot. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I would say is there's no experience is the most important thing. Experience you don't get sitting in a in a classroom at law school for three years, building companies or being in transactions, whatever the experience, however you can get the experience, get experience. And that that's hard to do in a classroom. I hear you loud and clear there. You know, there's so much more, but also for me, actually my jump into venture was because my boss then saw, oh, you have a legal background. That's going to be helpful. So yeah, never underestimate what what you've done in the past, even though you don't see it in in your future for sure. So talk to us a little bit now about Volpes. You know, I was so intrigued. I, I went, uh, through the archives, so I, I, I saw uh, one of Steve's very early, um, you know, talks about his vision. Uh, and Artradis, for those who, who don't know, is, of course, one of the very first few homegrown Asian hedge funds, multi-billion, that did really well and actually uh, reaped rewards uh, during the Asian financial crisis when many others were licking their wounds. So so tell us a little bit about Volpes. So the uh, CEO and founder of Volpes, Steve Diggle, co-founded a hedge fund in 2002 called Artratus, Singapore-based. By 2005 or six, the, before the financial crisis, it was a $2 billion hedge fund. 18 months later, just after the financial crisis, it was a $5 billion hedge fund. So they made $3 billion for their investors and themselves. Um, and what they, were, they had two strategies. One was long vol- volatility and one was short credit. And the short credit strategy is essentially a bet against the financial system. So when the financial system collapsed, um, that uh, strategy paid handsomely. They continued to run the hedge fund for a couple of years until 2009, 2010. And they realized that they were never going to be as well positioned um, for another event like they were for the financial crisis with the short credit strategy. So they unwound the, the fund return money to investors. Uh, Steve's co-founder decided to retire. Steve figured he was still young, has four kids, likes coming to the office. So he took over the entity, bought it for a dollar, changed the name to Volpez, set up a family office. And the intention around Volpez at the time, and still is for the most part today, is to use the fund management business of Volpez to invest the family office, the family office money. So we're part family office. Some of the strategies that we pursue are largely backed by the family office. So we're the largest producer of avocados in New Zealand, uh, mm. the largest importer into Australia, a place that likes their avocados for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We also have a life sciences fund, which is largely Steve's money, uh, putting capital into early stage companies, trying to solve the world's most complex diseases. And then we have a, a bunch of other investments from four-star hotels in Sub-Saharan Africa to, to venture investments. So we were doing venture investing as a group before there was much of an ecosystem in Southeast Asia. And as a result, we were backers in, in a couple of the early unicorns that came through Singapore. And that's not because at the time we were sophisticated venture investors. It's because there was very few other places for uh, startup founders to go to raise capital. Before we dive a little bit deeper on Volpes's strategy now and, and definitely very diversified in the different holdings, 
things have changed dramatically. Like you said, it wasn't really much of a, a market back then. And um, now, you know, you're starting to finally see some of the exits and some of the rewards, right? But talk to us also about the family offices landscape. Uh, I, I read a, a recent report by Camden Wealth that the growth of single family offices, you know, in, in Asia Pacific. So first of all, there's an influx of foreign family offices that are basing now in Singapore, uh, where you typically are. And on top of that, 44% of the single family offices, uh, the growth of it is is from the Asian Pacific families themselves. What, what are you seeing here? Are they getting uh, more sophisticated? Are they thinking about also going into venture um, a lot more the way that uh, Steve has approached it? There's a few pieces there. One is Singapore is a great place to live. So it's no surprise that international family offices want to set up their headquarters there. There's also quite a bit of wealth in and around Singapore quite a few Singapore family offices of Singaporeans. I think, uh, I think there's a couple of trends. One, the, the generation that is now running the family offices are younger. Um, and so tech investing appeals more to those younger people. They also uh, have an aversion for investing in funds. I mean, some family offices will do a little bit of, of fund investing to get deal flow, but largely they want to invest directly in companies. So you have a lot more capital out there in family office money that's investing alongside funds. I was thinking about it this morning and, and we've made 18 investments in the last 12 months in venture and each investment we've made has totally different investors investing alongside us and a lot of those a lot of those investors are family offices or high net worth individuals and i think it's much different now the like, where founders can go to raise money there's a lot more individual and family office money out there so it, 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 it's a good time to be a founder looking to raise money because there are a lot of options particularly family offices I guess the only challenge is trying to find the family offices. They seem to be a little bit more opaque. They're not as kind of forward facing in terms of, of, of having brands, I guess, because they don't want people like me uh, emailing them, asking them to invest in my funds. <laughs> Seems like initially been more, okay, let's set up a SPV, let's figure things out. And then now, you know, they're actually, you know, even in, in Malaysia, of course, RHL Ventures uh, and, and Hamza is coming on uh, very soon as well and on Billion Dollar Moves, but they've started their own venture fund because to your point, I think... Uh, you know, with the money that they have, they want to do things themselves. And, and the next generation is excited about the future of tech. Are, are you seeing the same thing? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, I understand that family offices don't want to pay fees, right? That's why they don't want to invest in funds. But it'd be interesting when you have family office people on your show, how they approach getting deal flow. I mean, one of the, one of the benefits of having, you know, a team of, of people as we do in other venture funds, you can, you can go out and be a lot more active in the community and, and that generates deal flow. Before we actively pursued venture, most of the deal flow was inbound. People would know that Folk has existed and so people would come to us. Um, and it's a little bit different having the inbound deal flow than actually actively pursuing and going out and looking for things. So that actually was one of my questions. Said, right, look at your past 18 investments, it's very different. How are you thinking about this and how are you building your strategy and systems behind deal flow, behind the operations of it, and actually building a, a successful venture sum here? Invest in a little bit of everything. Um, mm -hmm. And our approach to venture investing was to have that same unfettered approach to investing. So we're investors in a couple of funds and, and speak to fund managers regularly. And it, it always struck me as strange when I would introduce a founder to a venture investor and the feedback would be like, oh, great founder, interesting business, but it's too early or it's too late for us. Mm. And I never understood if, if someone's investing in venture so that their investors can get a venture return, you know, why should they limit what they invest in? So our approach for venture investing, and I guess it's because we have the family office mentality, our approach is to look at everything. Nothing's too early stage, nothing's too late stage. We'll look across different segments. We'll look to buy secondaries. We'll do some venture debt. So our approach is trying to be a little bit different, not because I am being different, but just because we think there's opportunity out there that, that we can access for investors. And so we want to take a very um, uninhibited approach to, to venture investing, which I think is a little bit different than other venture investors. This is, we're launching our second fund. So we'll see if mm. we're right, if our approach is, you know, is the correct one, but we, we want to be able to look at everything um, both across different geographies and then you know, different segments and, and different industries, uh, different stages of companies. And, you know, that is the Goldilocks problem, right, of, of venture. Too early, too late, you know, it's too hot, too cold. Uh, it's not the right time. You're not the right fit. And founders are often baffled. Oh, okay, what did I do wrong there? You know, which what what is the right time in all this? Let me, let me uh, introduce a term that one of my investment committee members uses, which is 
let's not look for all unicorns. Let's invest in a few cockroaches. And what he means mm. by that uh, is companies are cockroaches are animals that you cannot kill, right? A nuclear like blast will not kill a cockroach. And what he means is if we invest in a company and we make five times our money for our investors, right? We can live with a few of those in the portfolio. I mean, let's sure. hope that we get a few unicorns. So we get the outsized returns because that's why our investors are investing in venture. But if we have a portfolio where the, the core groups, a bunch of cockroaches and we can make five to 10 times our money, like we can live with that. It's going to put out there is of course, you know, the limitation with, uh, that comment of too, you know, too late, too early is, of course, it's a closed fund structure, right? Where uh, the LPs have committed to a certain mandate and, and with uh, the family office approach, I think that's the flexibility that you definitely have and uh, which seems to be the case with some of your wins that we want to talk about. You are being opportunistic and that perhaps, you know, this this might be the way to go. But talk to us about this special opportunities fund that you, you mentioned. Uh, I know that uh, COVID has hit most people, has also evolved your thinking about approaching this fund. Tell us a little bit more. So the year before COVID, Volpez decided we were going to go out and raise a, an early stage fund for Southeast Asia. And we were going to raise a typical fund that was a little bit more focused around kind of pre-Series A. And we started raising money. We were having success. We were starting to call, the, we were starting to ask for subscription agreements to come in so that people would give us their commitment. And this was March 2020 by the time we started asking for subscriptions. And the same week that we were aggressively trying to get to the first close was the week that the world realized that this COVID, COVID thing was going to be a real problem. So our investors were coming back to us and saying, we want to support you. We want to be part of the fund, but you know, are you watching the news? Um, and the markets were like whipsawing up and down 3% um, from day to day. And so we said, understood, but let's put the fundraise on hold. Then a month later in April, 2020, we realized that some really good companies, some really good startup companies that had gone to fundraise before COVID weren't able to close out funding rounds because venture investors were pulling their commitments to those companies. So venture investors were saying, we can't get on a plane. We're not making any new investments until we can travel again, or we need to focus on our existing portfolio to make sure that those companies uh, who can survive COVID get all the attention they need. So good companies were kind of left stranded. So then it occurred to us that there would be a, that April, 2020 was a really good time to start investing because there wasn't a whole lot of capital flowing into these companies. So we went back to our investors and said, all right, we've scrapped the idea for a typical traditional long-term fund. We want to raise money and invest as quickly as we can right in the heart of COVID. And that helped us shape our approach for being multi-stage, looking at everything, looking across different geographies, because we wanted, we knew that it wasn't just a regional uh, issue. It was a, a global issue. So we started investing in June of 2020, and, and we've made 18 investments since then. Now, the world's changed since then. Venture, inve venture investors have figured out a way to get comfortable. So and part of that means they're a little bit more domestic in their view. So U.S. investors are actively investing in the U.S., Australia, where we do a fair amount of work. Australian investors are, are focusing on investing in Australia. And then across Southeast Asia, you know, people have figured out people based in Singapore figure out how to invest across the region. And I think valuations increasing globally have helped have helped that. Uh, so COVID actually was, was a benefit to us because instead mm -hmm. of taking a vanilla approach to venture investing, similar to everybody else that's investing in venture in Southeast Asia, you know, we shape kind of a unique approach and it's a, it's an approach that we like and it's an approach that we'll continue with. What have you learned then in terms of the approach of um, just even dealing in a time of crisis somewhat or or i guess investor hesitation panic in in some way uh in, in building your fund here our youngest analyst started as an intern we never met her met her on zoom she did a great job so we hired her still hadn't met her the strategy in the beginning was find really good companies find them quickly run them through a process and and make investments and we wanted to have a high cadence of investing because we didn't know how long COVID was going to last and we thought from the beginning that the arbitrage opportunity was to invest when others were you know, panicked and frozen. So mm -hmm. most venture investors and family offices too take a farming approach, which is companies come to them and then they pick through the opportunities that they like. We knew that if we wanted to invest quickly, we had to take a hunting approach instead of a farming approach. So we had to actively go out and reach out to companies. So our team uh, started putting together a list of companies across Southeast Asia that had raised seed or series A money in the last 12 months. This is kind of the early part of COVID. Companies that had raised a year ago would be going to market at a really bad time, you know, as COVID was like, you know, rife across the region. Right. And so, so we figured out like different companies across different sectors and different geographies. And then we actively cold called and we reached out to them to say, 
hey, we're Volpez, we're actively investing. Where are you in your, in your fundraise? Where are you in your funding round? Have you thought of doing a bridge round? I know it's scary out there, but there are people like us that are willing to invest. Well, what's your investment philosophy here? Are you looking at certain check sizes? So philosophy and also the next part I want to get into is because you're sort of multi-stage and you're opportunistic, how do you think about portfolio construction, even though it's not within, I guess, a closed end structure? One of the nice things about being diverse across stages, sectors, geographies is that the portfolio construction means that some of our later stage investments uh, should give us returns more quickly. Now there'll be lower multiple returns, but you know, if we look at the cockroach example, we'll make three to five times our money in two or three years. So we'll start returning capital more quickly, some of the later stage investments. Some of the earlier stage investments will take longer, but should have you know, much larger multiples of return. And we're across different geographies. So you know, Vietnam, for instance, which I think is probably the most interesting market in Southeast Asia, is having a really tough time right now with COVID. But we're not just Vietnam heavy across different geographies. So our risk is spread out, um, which I like. And, and I also like the fact that we'll start returning money more quickly some of the later stage stuff, and then have the opportunity to see uh, how some of the more exciting early stage companies uh, fare as they grow. Interesting. And of course, you also do funds, right? So you're an LP in a couple of funds and seeded that. that. Is that uh, from, as we've seen with a, a few LPs who also do direct investing, is that a way to uh, sort of also access deal flow? Or are you looking at being LPs in funds in certain markets as a, a real strategic tool here? Before we started doing this ourselves, we invested in some funds in the region to get deal flow um, because we mm. thought that was the only way you could get deal flow. Now, with our hunting approach, you know, I'm pretty confident that our deal flow is as good as anyone. So I don't think we would do, we would invest in funds in the region. So there's a, a fund in uh, the U.S., Rebel Fund, which invests in YC Combinator companies, um, right. which a couple of us have personally invested in to get deal flow just to see what's happening at YC. And YC is doing a lot more in Southeast Asia and Australia. And those are really early stage companies uh, that we just wouldn't see or know about. Uh, but by sure. investing in this fund, we get some deal flow. So if, there, if we think that there's a strategic value in being part of a fund that might lead to the actual Volpez Venture Group making investments down the road, that's something that we'll look at. And we'll either do it in a personal capacity or we'll offer it to our investors. I mean, it's kind of hard to ask investors to give us money, take fees on those, and then invest in someone else's fund uh, where we get hit with fees. So... Um, I think there's value. I mean, I, I really do think, obviously, because I'm in this business, I do think there's value in investing in funds because you see so much mm. um, that fund can generate in terms of deal flow. So it's interesting. We'll continue to look for strategic opportunities to do that. So for, for your investments moving forward now, what, what are you thinking with regard to um, who are going to be your, your winners? What, what is the criteria? What sort of discipline are you applying to this multi-stage approach and which companies are going to be invested in now and also your follow on reserves and all that. How, how do you think about that? So valuations, valuations in the US where, where I'm sitting, you know, I'm sitting not too far from Silicon Valley are just, I mean, they're at, atmospheric. It's, it's somewhat ridiculous how, uh, yeah. how the valuations are and companies raise at a big valuation and then they go and raise money six months later at, at two times what you know, looked like a crazy valuation six months ago. That hasn't really caught on across Southeast Asia and Australia and New Zealand, for the most part, I think it's changing. Uh, so a couple of companies in our portfolio are now going back to market. And it's like, wow, okay. You, the valuations aren't like they are in the US, but they're different than they were 12 months ago. Um, yeah. So I think, I, I think Asia Pacific has some room to run here. So our approach is to, just to try to get into as many good companies as we can, um, and then take a view the next time they go to market if we want to, if we want to continue supporting those. So we typically don't hold back money for like for follow on investments. You know, our approach is to invest as quickly as possible. Um, we also have to raise smaller funds. So Volpez is an investor in three unicorn, but we did that from a, a balance sheet of an investment vehicle many years ago. So I get no credit mm. for that track record. So when I talk <laughs> about the funds or institutional investors, they're like, show me your track record. And I'm like, we're investors in three unicorns. And they're like, show me the track record. And I'm like, well, it's not in a fund. So, so when we raise the Special Opportunities Fund, our universe of investors is much smaller. So it's family offices and high net worth individuals. We're quickly raising our second fund as the first fund's track record starts to materialize. Um, so I'm still, like, I still have to play in that same pool of, of limited investors. That will change, mm -hmm. I think, the next time, you know, after this fund, where we can have a track record and actually attract larger capital. And then we may reserve more money for follow-on. 
But now our approach is to um, get good investors behind us. Let's make as many investments in good companies as we can. And then as those companies go to raise money, we'll either invest from the next fund or we'll take it to our existing investors for co-investment and we'll pool money through SPVs. But in terms of right. things we look at, we're looking at good growing companies. Um, for the most part, we're investing in software companies that you know, get paid through a SaaS model. So it's so software as a service. So it's really easy to sort of value the company, how much revenue are they generating each month and, and how does that grow month over month? And then the founder or founding team is got to be greater than 50% of uh, you know, what we look for. So it doesn't matter how good the business is. If, if we have an issue with the, the founder or the founding team, um, you know, we, we wouldn't make the investment. Conversely, if we're unsure about the model or the market, but love the founder, we're probably willing to, to make a bet on people. And then how scalable is it? Is it a company that's only going to operate within the, the boundaries of Singapore? That's probably not super interesting. Is it a company in the Philippines that can also expand into Thailand, Vietnam? And that gets more interesting. So great founders, scalable businesses, uh, and then reasonably priced companies. Although I think we're going to have to start redefining what reasonably priced means as valuations creep up in our part of the world. What's your, I guess, underlying thesis that brings to fold a lot of these, you know, SaaS companies and, and all the different um, investments that you've made in the, you know, 18 investments in 12 months? That's, that's something. I think it's the power of what you can do with a smartphone. I think like sitting in traffic in, in Yangon, Myanmar, Burma, and seeing a monk with no shoes on, like looking at a smartphone. Um, yeah. And if you look across Southeast Asia, 650 million people, half are under the age of 30, like 90% have a phone. I think 5 to 10% have a bank account, right? So mm-hmm. with that phone, you can do your banking, you can see a doctor, you can, you can get entertainment, you can get continuing education. I mean, the list goes on and on. So uh, the conviction is the power of, of what that phone provides for people, um, particularly in you know, more remote places you know, or cities that have bad traffic, which is just about every city in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, being able to, to use your phone to, to better yourself um, as these young populations grow and as middle classes emerge. And I think it's incredibly powerful. Talking about that, you know, of course, one of your uh, exciting deals, actually two exciting deals, uh, Property Guru and Sharesies, right? All digital platforms to enable uh, purchases and, and approaching it differently. T- tell us a little bit more about these wins and, and what you're excited about with them. Property Guru, we led the seed round uh, many years ago at a time when there were very few options for it. Steve and Yanni, the founders, to raise capital. And, and Volpez was one such uh, investor willing to invest in early stage founders. And I think the, the thesis around Property Guru was really just about investing in the founders, um, Steve and Yanni. And uh, so we supported them. And they were able to quickly generate revenues. They didn't have to go back to raise more money very quickly. So we didn't get, we didn't see a whole lot of dilution. So it was a very good investment for us. We've sold uh, along the way some secondaries to existing investors as larger private equity guys have come in. And, and obviously, they're doing a SPAC listing now, a Peter Thiel-backed uh, SPAC listing, which is great for Singapore. It's great for Property Guru. Um, so that's an exciting one. But we're not, we're not that involved other than uh, as a shareholder these days. And Yanni, one of the co-founders, is on our investment committee and very helpful, um, both in terms of finding deals, but also working with entrepreneurs. He's got a great reputation, as does his co-founder, Steve, of really helping the ecosystem. Uh, so they've done a lot for, for I guess, venture and startups in Southeast Asia. So Sharesies is, is an interesting one. Sharesies is a New Zealand-based company that offers fractional uh, ownership and shares and low-cost trading and is trying to help kind of empower uh, the next generation of investors. And uh, and the pandemic's helped Sharesies quite a bit. People have done a lot of uh, day trading, at-home trading, uh, particularly during lockdowns, and, uh, and they're going to expand into Australia and then into Singapore. Um, and that one is incredibly exciting and we're, we're very happy to be part of the Sharesies journey. You know, the, the way you talk about sort of the venture landscape and how things are changing, you know, and something that we're seeing as well is uh, capital is increasingly becoming a commodity um, where really good founders can find, right? The, the, the industry is just flush with capital. How do you as an investor win those sort of deals and stay relevant? You know, we hope that people like, want to work with us, us being Yanni and Hugh, the two investment committee members, um, because they can help entrepreneurs grow and scale businesses. And, and I, I believe that when founders get on, the, get on a Zoom call, because that's how we communicate these days with founders, yeah. that they, you know, they quickly pick up that Yanni and Hugh are real business builders. I mean, it helps that Volpez has a couple of unicorns on our website. So it, 
it proves that we've invested in a couple of good companies. But um, I, but I think our value is having two investment committee members that really know how to how to work with founders. And the other thing is we hope that we that the match is reciprocal. So we hope that we're investing in founders that will use us and reach out to us and um, and and access the help that we can provide. So well, now coming to the end, uh, look, looking ahead, the next couple of years for Volpe is what, what can we expect from you? Hopefully more exits. Um, no, I mean, I think you, you mentioned it earlier that we're starting to see exits in Southeast Asia uh, and Australia. So there's a massive deal this week after pay in Australia was sold for $29 billion to Square. I mean, we want to see exits. We want to reward investors for you know, having confidence in venture investors. Um, and so that's what I would like to see, not just for Volpes, but for, for Southeast Asia um, in general. And I think the real thing I'd like to see is I'd like to see Silicon Valley uh, and other global investors start pouring money into, into the region. because so I think it'll benefit those of us that, were, you know, that are investing now. Well, now we come to uh, the final segment, uh, billion dollar questions, eight quick questions. And you say the first thing that comes to mind. So first question for you is when you think of someone successful, who do you think of and why field? That's a tough one. Instead of thinking of who is successful, I think of what does it mean to be successful? And then I ask myself, am I successful? And being successful means like you accumulate something, either wealth or happiness. Um, so I, I really measure it like, where am I? And you know, so on the happiness scale, I think I am pretty successful. We have two healthy little boys. The next goal is to make them you know, good, good humans, good adults. Um, in terms of wealth creation, like you know, continue to try to to try to be successful in the venture space. So I don't, I don't really look at other people and and judge whether they're successful or not. I really kind of hold myself to a standard of trying to be successful. I love that. I was going to point out this is a very lawyer answer of like challenging the question, reframing, and giving me a different definition of it. <laughs> I love it. What is your highest high and your lowest low feel? Well, I think raising uh, raising money, whether it's at the fund level or for a startup. You get lots of highs and lots of lows. Um, mm. I mean, there's nothing worse than like trying to get somebody to invest and then finally have them say, uh, "We're not going to do it." And then, uh, equally, it's really exciting when you finally get somebody that wants to support and be part of uh, be part of your fund. So, I, I fundraising because you get kicked, you get kicked in the face a lot, and you have to pick yourself up, and uh, and then you get to appreciate those highs. Common misconceptions about field pickering. That would assume people actually think about field pickering, which I'm not sure many yeah. people do. But um, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. But, <laughs> uh, maybe after being on your widely viewed podcast, people will start thinking. <laughs> um, I, I think that that I don't have empathy. Right? I mean, I when I worked for the, um, the carbon offset company, we were venture backed, and we go through periods where cash was tight, and like we weren't sure if we we're going to make payroll in two weeks. So I have great empathy mm. for people in startups uh, and entrepreneurs, and I know how tough it is. So. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't take investing in startups lightly. I, I realize, you know, the amount of uh, stress that they're under. So, you know, I have great empathy. I'm not sure, you know, that's clear when people speak to me. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll address that. Worst advice given to you or that you've heard being given? You'll never be able to raise a first-time fund. Hardest lesson as a leader? I've chosen to, to be in this position. I've chosen to build out this business. Um, so when you know, things go wrong, uh, it's my fault. Right. So I think the mm -hmm. hardest thing is to accept all blame. You know, it starts with me and uh, uh, ends with me. Biggest fear? Not getting back to Singapore or having to do two weeks in a hotel <laughs> with my two little boys. Oh, that will be interesting. Um, best habit that you've picked up in the last few years? Yoga. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yoga clears my head. Like, it doesn't matter how little sleep I had, how much stress, how many gin and tonics I had. I do yoga in the morning. Uh, and I'm ready. I'm ready to rock after that. Imagine your two sons. I'm going to pick this one. Uh, what are the three values that you want your sons to continue to hold as priorities in their lives? Empathy, having the ability to you know, see what other people are going through. Curiosity. Um, and then confidence, I think, to be confident, mm -hmm. to take risks and uh, do things that are uncomfortable to them. The community that tunes in are typically funders or founders. Uh, what, what would your number one advice be for them who are deep in the rough of things? Work with good people, particularly if you're raising money. Um, you know, think about how this person's going to react when things get tough, right? So you know, look for good partners. And if you surround yourself with good people, 
uh, the chance of a good outcome are increased. Well, Phil, that gives me a very good end to this wonderful power session with you. And thank you so much for your time. I think we covered a lot of bases here and starting to unpack the family office strategy, understanding your approach to Volpes and building a venture arm for a family office and growing, uh, you know, building your own legacy through that. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm looking forward to working together in some way and uh, continuing to see the success that you'll continue to achieve, I'm sure. Excellent. Well, you're very nice to have me on. Thank you so much, Sarah.